Hi, so welcome back to Foresight Paradigm. I'm starting a new series called Paradigmatic Discussions, where I'm going to be basically just going over one topic and really digging into it instead of doing various topics and the interview guest topics. And I have Scott Gaines back with me. How, hi, Scott. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. And so you're going to be kind of a at least part-time co-host uh, for yeah, the time being. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be, be fun. fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a lot going on in the world right now. And so the topic today, though, is going to be cosmology, you know, and where the universe came from. So we're kind of going to lift our heads to the stars a little bit. <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, get away from all the stuff going on. It's good to so, look um, away every now and then and look up. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. Um, so starting off with cosmology, the, the Kalam cosmological argument, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that. It uh, originated with Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages, and uh, it basically is a, a syllogism that says everything that begins to exist um, has a cause, or basically. Well, how it goes is um, everything with a beginning, everything that begins, sorry, everything that <laughs> begins to exist has a cause. Um, the universe began to exist, so therefore the universe has a cause. Now you'll notice that this doesn't say anything about a deity necessarily at all, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so there are all kinds of problems with this, um, but let's take it one part of the, of the argument at a time. So everything that begins to exist has a cause. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, if you look at it in more of, I guess, I would say local terms or at least from how humans typically tend to look at things, especially back then, uh, you, you know, it's kind of like, I guess in a way, the blind watchmaker argument, if you see a watch, you think, you know, this is not like nature, something had to have made this or created it. And it's not really like anything around you. So in that sense, I can see why that line of reasoning would be something that, uh, you know, a group of people, when was this argument about? Was this uh, how many centuries ago was this exactly? I, it, I believe remember. it was the the Middle Ages, the 1100s. Yeah. Um, so it, it, so it kind of links back to Aristotle a little bit, and Thomas Aquinas kind of took it up mm -hmm. later after that. So it was definitely before Aquinas. So I think 1100s. Okay, so like about a thousand years ago. A, yeah, I was thinking it was like uh, like over a thousand years or around that era when we all know Baghdad was the cultural center of the world. And so yeah. in that regards, giving what we know the best position people could reach at that time, I can see it making a lot of sense. But now that we're in the scientific era of, of human thought and human thinking, it just really doesn't add up. I mean, like, look at how many things we've discovered that we have no idea how it began, but we can figure everything out after that. And, you know, that, right. that way of thinking really wasn't possible until the scientific revolution came about. So I think for the time they were in when this came about, it, it's a really good position to have. It's kind of like how deism was as, as far as you could go for a very long time. Right. But just think well, of how many examples. I'm sure you have some of, of, of where that just doesn't apply. Oh, yeah. Well, definitely when we look at the everyday scale of cause, we have cause and effect, right? Um on our human level scale, we, you know, cause and effect. And we're in our universe, uh, we exist within an arrow of time. So that's how it tends to go. But even logically, David Hume made the point that we, we observe one thing following another, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the preceding thing caused the subsequent thing. Um, we just see it happen. Yeah. Th th <laughs> those are the patterns we see. So logically, you can make that point. But when we modern modern science has really laid that in a lot of doubt because quantum physics, um, you know, there's all kinds of examples where things don't have any apparent cause at all. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at. Uh, got one quote here from a, a physicist. Uh, so physical events at the atomic and subatomic level are, are observed to have no evident cause. For example, when an atom at an excited energy level drops to a lower lower level and emits a photon, a particle of light, we find no cause of that event. Uh, similarly, no cause is evident in the decay of a radioactive nucleus. 
And, you know, we have virtual particles that pop in and out of existence. And we have matter mm -hmm. and antimatter that collide and reappear. Um, so, you know, on the quantum level, definitely that that's thrown into a lot of doubt. Um, also on that, you know, whatever begins to exist as a cause. Uh, if we move to the second part of that argument of that syllogism, uh, the universe began to exist. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, once again, going back to their level of understanding, that is where they would be at. But my whole thing is, and my whole way of thinking as a skeptic is, how do we know that that's true? I mean, if we're going to talk about something having a beginning, and if time begins with the universe, how do we know the universe really began? What if it just always was here? You know, we tend to always think of something is or isn't. Well, what if it just no. always was? And I mean, that's why the scientific method <laughs> and approaching things like that is a much better way of operating because think of, you know, like the next step of this is taking it to the level of God. And basically this is God of the gaps, you know, to infinity. And if you want to slide God in there in anything, just think of everything that we used to claim God was the cause of that we now have a very logical scientific explanation for and so my whole thing is is how do these people who are making this claim and especially the people who are still making this claim today how do they know that it's true and every time mm -hmm. you ask them that it just crumbles i mean like it really kind of boils down to like you know we've all watched the atheist uh, like atheist experience probably where matt dillahoney has had these arguments with people about cosmology and he, and he just asked the simple question how do you know that it's true? And all right. you get is appeals to emotion or personal experience and things like that. And so when you go from an idea like God, which is a big idea, but I think the universe is a much bigger idea. It's kind of like the whole thing of when you look at the Bible, that God is too small for my universe. And it really is. And so I think when you look at it that way, it becomes much more interesting because the not knowing is what makes it interesting for me. And I think mm -hmm. we need to consider all possibilities, not just one or two out of the infinite choices we probably have. Right. Yeah. And again, uh, modern science. So physics tell, <clears throat> physicists tell us that when we talk about the Big Bang, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the universe started at the Big Bang, right? Yes, exactly. Like, like I mean, Sean Carroll said that I like, like we shouldn't think of the Big Bang as the beginning. We should think of it as the end of our understanding. And that's a very powerful way to think about it. Yeah. So, you know, the universe could have always existed like that in that state. Or mm -hmm. it could have been birthed from a, another universe. Exactly. It could be part of an eternal uh, multiverse, you know. Brian Green has some good things to say about that, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, the, in the universe, you know, if you want to say God always existed, why can't the universe be the thing that's always existed? And it, it is uh, simpler than a God, and we have much more evidence yeah. for its existence <laughs> than a God. I mean, adding Way a God more. to things is, you know, it really compounds things. You know, it's adding something on top that's not ne needed, you know. The idea of God is not found or needed in any theory of science. Um, yes. You know, people like to add that to it, but it doesn't really add anything... <laughs> to our understanding so you know uh, definitely um so yeah the universe could be eternal the the quantum foam could be eternal the uh we could go in like uh kind of eternal expansions and collapses like you know a cycle of you know kind of like the eastern mythological ideas you know of continuous cycles uh we don't exactly know um but yeah so Already, the, there's big problems with the first two parts of the Kalam. You know, yes. uh, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Not necessarily. Um, the universe began to exist. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, and, and Sean Carroll uh, in a debate with William Lane Craig. Um, Craig was trying to get him to say, you know, that Alan Guth, uh, who's part of the uh, the Lincoln Guth. I forget, forget what the, the name of the, uh, the, the theorem, the, the paper is. But, um, and he called in Guth on video saying, and Guth ha had a sign held up that said, you know, actually, I suspect that the universe is eternal. 
Um, you know, and and Craig said, well, maybe that's your, you know, your feeling or your hope. And, <laughs> and <feeling>. Carol <laughs> articulated, no, that's the best model based on, you know, everything that we know going yeah. forward. And that's why Guth uh, suspects that. Um, so going to the, the last part of the Kalam, if the universe has a cause, I'm sorry, the universe has a cause, therefore the universe has a cause. So again, we, we have causes within the universe, um, that we experience on the human level, cause and effect, no doubt about that, as far as what it appears to us. But that doesn't mean that the universe as a whole operates the same way as things inside the universe. So exactly. it may not have a cause, you know, causes are things within arrows of time. So it may not have a cause at all. It may be eternal. Exactly. Or it could be, again, it could be, uh, we have uh, M theory, which Stephen Hawking elucidated in his book, The Grand Design, um, that kind of takes from super string theory and kind of is, is an attempt to like get a unified theory of everything. And it says basically that the universe did literally pop into existence from nothing. <laughs> um in theory uh basically it's a, a quantum fluctuation and um so so we have that so again the universe may have a cause it may not but the cause could be natural um and when you look at the history of science everything that we understand um have come to understand every phenomena has had a natural cause yes it has it has mindless physics behind it basically yeah um, and 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 like something i just like to add in is that if you think about everything within the universe, is there anything that there's just one of? So, you know, this universe could be one of many and it could pop in and out at any time. And as far as um, expanding and collapsing and expanding again, that seems to have a lot of evidence pointing for it as well, because think of, you know, Edwin Hubble, when he discovered the red light shift and he found out that, hey, everything is spreading apart and it's getting faster the further away it gets. That requires quite a lot of energy. So yeah. if that is the case, is this eventually going to slam back together? Is it going to be the slow, you know, collapse to absolute zero? I mean, there's a ton of different ways this could go. And I think it's very arrogant to say that, you know, my God of choice out of the thousands available is the reason for this. I mean, that's yet another leap. You have to make your specific mm -hmm. God, of course. And then and, um, and then and then Aristotle, you know, in, in his first mover or prime mover uh, argument, wasn't it like it took 17 movers? Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Was some we'll, we'll get into Aristotle number. here in a second. That's going to be our next section here. Okay. Um, yeah. But Hawking also made the point that, you know, in quantum physics, again, we see things kind of popping into existence. And the universe used to be very, very small at the level of the mm -hmm. quantum. Yes. So, you know, that's it. Right? It's and, and all available so, evidence would lead us to believe that since it's expanded this far over this huge amount of time, it obviously yeah. had to want to be closer together. You know, that's not so, feelings or God. That's just facts. Yeah. So there are many possibilities. And, you know, again, no theory or finding of science includes God. And that's not even a, a really a well-defined term. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's kind of a poison to the enterprise of science to um, constantly be trying to be claim things for God. Oh, there's a gap here. There's a gap here. <laughs> oh, maybe this means God. It's really complicated. Yeah. You know, it's kind of just, it, it's poisonous to let, letting people just openly follow the evidence and get where they're going to go, how they found out everything. It's it's really an impediment to that process, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and you know faith is a poison to doubt, and science is all about doubt. You know, it's systematic doubt. Um, so definitely, so even given that every part of the Kalam it might be, even if we grant every part of it, it still says nothing about God, necessarily. Yeah. So this big, you know, foundational piece of apologists like William Lane Craig are just completely fallacious i mean like the like the god hypothesis itself it's just full of holes so yeah. um getting on to um aristotle so we do aristotle did have the kind of the, the prime mover that uh everything he had the idea that everything is about everything that moves needs it needs a somebody something that pushed it basically mm -hmm. and uh that was kind of physics for a long time and and christianity especially Thomas Aquinas really adapted, you know, the poverty of 
of Christian thought, you know, really they they repurposed paganism, Plato too, you know, with his mm-hmm. uh, immortal soul and his uh, platonic forms and all kinds of things. Uh, but you know, so getting to we're gonna get, kind of Sean Carroll's book, The Big Picture, I think is the best science book ever written, um, and it actually goes beyond science. It's kind of like a philosophical piece also about you know existential thought and 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 uh meaning and purpose and things like that but as far as the science part goes i mean it covers basically everything in, in science but you know he's a physicist and it's mainly physics and i think it's just easily the best science book so we're going to kind of use that as a guide um through our discussion a little bit so when he, he he talks about aristotle so what he says is you know for aristotle uh physics was a story of natures and causes um, and that's kind of how it was te- teleological. So everything had kind of a, an end goal. Everything was operating with an end goal in mind. And so we've gone from an ancient cosmos of causes and purposes to a modern one of patterns and laws. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the central role of cause <clears throat> and goals that, that used to be kind of the main thing is not, is not, it's not the underlying main aspect of things anymore. Yeah, because like trying to to say that the cosmos has a goal is absolutely ridiculous. But right. once again, like the Kalam, considering where they were at at the time with the arguments they had, everything did seem to have a purpose. And I mean, it, it's really hard to get away from that, like you said, because of faith. Right. And uh, Carol points out there was another Islamic Middle Age scholar called Ibn Sina, and he kind of talked about how in a vacuum things actually keep going like an an undisturbed projectile would keep moving at a constant rate forever without any kind of um, resistance, you know, and that gets us to like inertia, the concept that bodies will move uniformly unless acted upon by something. So, um, so we move from that, from Aristotle, you know, physics being a story of natures and causes. Um, And now, so at the deepest level, we currently know, he says the basic notions are things like space time Quantum fields, equations of motion and interactions, no causes, whether material, formal, efficient, or final. But there are levels on top of that where the vocabulary changes, which, you know, our human level, uh, how, how we interpret things, see things, experience things on our level. Um, and so, again, he says causes didn't have the, the central role that they once did. The universe doesn't need a push. It can just keep going. So... Uh, yeah, so that's kind of really old thinking, ancient thinking. Um, mm-hmm. So you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it's it's very well said by Carol. And the thing that, you know, me and you know, being, being atheists and skeptics, is that the best way to find something out is to doubt everything. And as Feynman said, the easiest person to fool is yourself. Right. And if you look at these arguments, they are really sort of an elaborate way to kind of trick yourself into finding purpose and meaning in this huge void. I mean, we know the universe is a massive void, at least for us as we are currently. <laughs> there right. may or may not be some life form where the universe is its plaything, and it goes from one edge to the other edge like we would driving across America or something. But as it currently stands, with it expanding apart, I think humility is the best way forward, not saying I know this because of a God or because of an argument from uh, what the, the Bronze Age. And right. just this does not seem like a good way of operating, but this is part of the journey of science and philosophy and how they have helped us get to where we are now. Yeah. And we should really be thankful for you know these people making these fallacious arguments because without them we wouldn't have the really good ones we have now and what's really fascinating to think about is four or five hundred years from now if we could live that long and come back and watch this video you know some of these theories are going to be much different too and that's good that that's the strength of science yeah. is that it does change over time it changes its arguments and it usually and builds upon what's come before it does exactly it, it typically it's not like a wholesale like toppling mm-hmm. of, of that so like you know we have newtonian physics and then came Einstein with, with general relativity and also the quantum revolution. But that did not really invalidate Newtonian physics because it still works in its domain. 
you know, we, we use Newtonian physics to get rockets to the moon. Mm-hmm. So, and speaking of yeah. Newton, just imagine if he would not have been poisoned by the God idea, how much further could he have taken yeah. all of his uh, works? I mean, like if you look at, you know, I think it was about 100 years from him to Laplace who took his argument or, or not argument, his equations that one step further. I mean, Newton could have easily done that. We're talking about one of the smartest people to ever live, maybe the smartest pound for pound and you know without him saying well god did it when he ran into that wall of how are these different you know planets tugging on each other and there's this big tug in the middle of the sun (laughs) and there's things coming through the solar system tugging and messing me up if he could have you know like if he could have just had a calculator like we do now where would we be at you know that's crazy to think about yeah and you know i'm reminded of a apologist like uh like Dinesh D'Souza, who tried to say, you know, Genesis, you know, is like the only religion that says the universe started from nothing. And that's not even really true. No, it's not. Or very likely not true. <laughs> and all you got to do is read a little bit in Genesis, a very, uh, just a little bit, and you can see the duplications in Genesis 1 and 2. They contradict each other. <laughs> they tell two different stories. Um, and their order is contrary to science. <laughs> the order that it's we have awful. things in. Like, don't we yeah. have... I don't remember the exact, you know, order in Genesis in, in either one, but I think it's, you know, you get you get uh, stars after you have light. Um, well, you get water before you even have light. So where did that hydrogen come from? You know, is that yeah. special hydrogen? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, going on with Carol, uh, he says the progress of modern physics and cosmology has sent a fairly unequivocal message. That there's nothing wrong with the universe existing without any external help. As G- Galileo taught us, one of the foundational features of modern physics is that objects can move and tend to do so without any need for an external cause or mover. And so he goes on kind of what we touched on. We don't know whether the universe had a beginning or not. Um, and there may have been a moment uh, that looks like our Big Bang that could have been just a phase, a temporary phase uh, transition uh, from a previous universe that could have been there already. Um, and so he also goes on to say, you know, to the question of whether or not the universe could possibly exist all by itself without any external help, science offers an unequivocal answer. Sure, it could. We don't know. We don't know the final laws of physics, but there's nothing we know about the such laws uh, that would suggest that the universe needs any help to exist. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a so, very good point. And, you know, like yeah. saying that, like, I don't know if we're going to get into it or not, but the whole fine tuning argument is just. We absurd, are. That's next. Know. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll save my thoughts. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to go over here. All right. So, yeah, getting into fine tuning. Um, Carol has said that's probably the, the best argument for God, even though he says it's still a terrible argument. Um, because it at least plays by honest rules. It, 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 it looks at the universe um, and takes in, uh, into account what we see. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, because um, I wrote a blog called uh, Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing? And I, I'm going to see if we can um, share here. I don't know if it's going to work. It didn't before. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, let's see here. Uh Right. But, you know, while you're doing that, just think of how awesome a question that is to ponder. And just yeah. the fact that we can even do that is owed to science. If we still were following religion, <laughs> we would not even be able to question this. All right. So how can you see things there, Scott, on your end? Can you see the... I'll, I'll, like, it looks good right now. It's it's okay. straight on towards me, not so this like is... before. <laughs> Yeah, this is my blog from uh, Atheist Alliance International. Why is there something rather than nothing? Um, so going down to fine tuning. All right. So I'm just kind of going to read this section because I kind of like compiled a lot of the reason, a lot of the things against the idea of fine tuning in this paragraph. Uh, yeah, it's a very good blog. Yeah, definitely. Th- thank you. So whether it's the universe indicated by inflation or the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, the multiverse is where science seems headed, with many physicists subscribing to some form of it. Now, there have, been, there have even been impact 
circles in the microwave background that it's been speculated could be impacts from another universe. And though the multiverse does invalidate the so-called fine-tuning argument, there's plenty more left to address it. Mm-hmm. So, we're microscopically small in time and space. Now, via the Copernican principle, we continue to have our imagined importance and centrality in the universe refuted. So, we can just kind of stop on these one at a time as we get to them. I don't have to read the entire thing, so, you know, lose the track. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we are very, very small in the universe, and, and everything we've learned pretty much has kind of refuted and demoted our imagined centrality. You know, the idea from religion is kind of we're on the center stage performing <laughs> for our master. Um, and it doesn't seem that way yeah. at all. You know? So no, we're, we're extremely small. Uh, we, we can't even really imagine how small we are. I mean, I've heard. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, you know, in, in the sort of midst of fine tuning, our planet isn't even fine tuned for us. Think of all the places you go, all the gases you can't even smell that if you breathe in, you just instantly die. All the natural disasters. Go on the Weather Channel right now and see if you can't find a good argument for, as Sam Harris once said so funnily, that we're pissing Poseidon off right now. You know, why are we not praying to Poseidon? Right. And, you know, I, I recently had uh, my quarantine conversations number 14. I, I had uh, an interview with a, a theist named uh, Pedro. He has a uh, channel, Ask and Wonder. And the, the the whole discussion was about imagining a secular world, which you really don't have to. You know, just look at Western Europe or Scandinavia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's in the world. Um, mm-hmm. But it, he, 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 he just threw in this thing at the very end of the discussion. And he said, you know, when I look at the world and God helping everybody, and I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. Now, one of the most basic objective facts you can observe is how indifferent the universe is. And he yes. started trying to say, you know, that's not an observation from science. And I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I'll tell you what's an observation is when science uh, adds up the numbers of how many children die every year. That's yeah. definitely an observation. <laughs> and we, see, the thing is, theism does make claims that can, that can be uh, analyzed and, and science can be brought to bear on those claims, you know. So if you want to say that, you know, belief in God or a specific God, you know, blesses a certain country or people or person, we can we can look at the data and we can look at this and, and we can refute these claims, you know. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's just BS, man. But Yeah, and the whole thing about blessing, I mean, why is America so cursed? And like you said, Scandinavia or Finland or Switzerland so blessed, I guess. Right. And one thing that I, I tend to notice is that, you know, when you put your God glasses on, you, you know, you just see what you want to see. I mean, it really does not matter what you, what you see. You can interpret it to fit mm-hmm. you what you want. So, you know, if we say that, that people, that humanity has gotten progressively better over time, which I, I think it overall has, and I think the data definitely, you know, you know Stephen Pinker's work, et cetera, backs it up. Yes, uh, exactly. You know, you could say, oh, well, it's God's plan. He's guiding us this way. But <laughs> if you say, oh, things have gotten horribly worse and, and we're just completely just miserable, you, you can say, well, you know, we're fallen beings. You know, it's a fallen world. Mm-hmm. And that's why we, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is or such an anti-scientific mindset, mm-hmm. you know. So <clears throat> anyway, moving on with the fine tuning. Um. So the universe is mostly lethal and inhospitable to known life. So that doesn't speak to fine tuning. You know, you go out of the atmosphere or many places on Earth, you can't breathe, you die. You know, there's, you know, deadly lethal radiation or cold, coldness of space. You know, you can't, can't breathe. Something uh, most... that's always, uh, sorry, something that's always kind of just like in the vein of this, I think, this argument alone is such a good just beat down on this idea that this God cares about us. Think right. of how little of the water on this planet is drinkable. Why? Why would you make this just this planet this ridiculous? I mean, just the surface you make us exist on moves seemingly in random patterns, and it's destructive. Yeah. But, but 90, I mean, 90, 99% out of all life is not extinct. Yeah, and I mean, the usual cop-out is, well, we're punished because, you know, that whore Eve got hustled by a talking snake. And I mean, when you look at this without emotion, it begins to show how ridiculous it is. And 
Think of everything we've been talking about, all the great discoveries we've made. Imagine if religion would have just gotten out of the way from the time of Galileo. Like, not even before that, just from the time of him, where would we be at? That really is the most, I think, damning, I would say, evidence against religion and against this God. Because if he did care about us, like, it's not even that the universe is so bad, uh, like badly designed. Why are we so badly designed? We eat, drink, and breathe through the same hole. This guarantees we're going to die just from having to do what this loving God has right. required us to do for existence. And, and, just, and we're, definitely, we're definitely adapted to, to the earth. The earth is not adapted to us. Yes, um, exactly. But going back to our smallness, you know, imagine a house being built for the purpose of a feeble electron within that house. You know, a fleeting, feeble little electron. And the whole house has been built for that electron, right? Yeah. Uh, so the parameters of the universe may have to be what they are. There may be things we're yet to understand about them. Again, this goes back to, you know, theists trying to claim everything for God, and it, it impedes actually finding things out. Um, and having predetermined conclusions is not helpful. No, not at <laughs> so, all. Not at all. Now, uh, one could point out that a person's family history consists in, ma in many random meetings and sperm egg combinations, but that doesn't mean that all those things happen just so they could be here, so that person could be here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many planets in the Goldilocks zones of many billions of solar systems. You know, no miracle there. Exactly. You mentioned that 99% of life has gone extinct. Most Some of, design. <laughs> yeah, there was only simple single cell life. You know, what was God waiting on? Why did he create dinosaurs for millions of years and then wipe them out? So the universe does kind of seem to be always trying to kill us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, many things always. in our bodily designs via evolution harm us. Also, a God wouldn't even need fine tuning. You know, a God can, magical God can do whatever he wants. Um, the fact that we that we find material basis for that support life is necessary in a material universe, right? So if everything was magical, then that would fit more the God scheme, right? I mean, I guess God could <clears throat> do things in ways that He's undetectable and completely unnecessary if He wanted to, <laughs> you know. But yeah, well, you know. I mean, think of it this way: uh, uh, like I got this from Neil Tyson. He said he would view us as being special if we were made out of some weird compound and not the most common things in the universe. And right. to me, that's much more beautiful that, as he said, the universe is in us and we are also in it. So, oh, yeah. so what's more awe-inspiring, that or having to worship a being that you must also fear punishment from, you know, right. eternal punishment. So right. just like you said, it's nonsense. Oh, yeah. The, the universe is full of... Uh people that have purposes, d different purposes, different meanings, different mysteries, um, you know, all of reality, you know, from uh, adventure to learning to friendship to sex to et cetera, et cetera. You know, life is full of meaning. Mm -hmm. But there is no evidence that the universe has a meaning or life has a meaning. Well, it, life's meaning is basically re reproducing, you know, as far as we can tell. <laughs> that, that's it. If you um, break it down to the most base level, yes. I mean, that urge is in the vast majority of us. Yeah. And, you know, there are things bigger than myself, you know, like human humanity and human progress and the universe is much bigger than me. So, mm -hmm. you know, also the theist explanation is one among many and makes extraordinary claims without even ordinary evidence. Um, yes. We also don't have any universes to compare ours to to speak of its conditions. Uh, there could be many kinds of life that could survive in other conditions apart from ours. Because no doubt, you know, if you change the parameters, uh, you know, we, as we are, cannot exist. But it yes. doesn't mean that there couldn't be other life if it was different. Or even now, mm -hmm. uh, say there's another universe or something that has different laws of physics. And, and when we say laws, they're, they're basically patterns. You know, they're not like what a lawgiver composes. They, they're just the patterns in, in nature. Um, they could be different. There could be different kinds of life, you know, based on silicon or, or, or I mean, I don't know. Maybe there could be some type of science fiction-y energy-based life. Um, yeah, or kind of doubt that, or but something weird. We don't yeah. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, also, the, the parameters of particles seem to be random in a mess. And there are many settings and many particles that don't have any relevance to life whatsoever. Yes. Uh, 
So that that's another point to make. Just the ones that pop in and out, like, yeah. why? What, I mean, what's the purpose of that? And, and the whole thing of, it, if this God can make this universe, why did he make life such a struggle and so awful? And so, I, I mean, it appears to be, like you said, just very random and, and without a purpose. I mean, if yeah. this God is all-knowing, why set up such a horrifying scenario? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we kind of underestimate nature. I mean, people talk about, oh, nature can't do this. Well, nature is what we see. Look what it does. You know, why do you need, why do you need for the the uh, foundation or the the prime thing to be some kind of mind, some type of you know conscious agent? It really seems to be anthropomorphizing the great universe beyond, based on you know people didn't understand things. So what were they going to use? But what they knew, like. You know, kings and people in authority, fathers, um, and people kind of making things, and they kind of extrapolated that and they projected that onto the universe. Um, That's and, and, exactly and, it. Yeah, that is exactly. And it makes it. sense. And look at the yeah, like look at you know, like we keep going to Christianity because we're Americans. Yeah. But just look at you know, in the Bible, it had to be a father because you didn't really listen to mom in in the you know Iron and Bronze Age, and right. it had to be a son because we know how daughters were treated. So. Yeah. So does it really make sense that a super mind was alone and bored forever and then for some reason one day created an experiment to lord <laughs> over and play hide and seek with? Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it make more sense that a universe came first and minds are things that evolve in universes? Kind of as, as science shows. And then, you know, if you ask what or who created the universe and you answer God, there's the problem of who or what created God. How could you have access to that knowledge and reliably demonstrate this being's existence in nature? Which God? Could God be an unconscious force, the sum total mm -hmm. of the universe, or just advanced alien life? You know, if we get kind of a Spinoza, and, that, and, and that many people say Spinoza is basically an atheist, but say he's a pantheist, you know, whoever that's a pantheist, and you want to say that the universe is God, obviously that's a very different conception of God than yes. some person that somehow exists outside of space and time, as if that makes sense. Um, and, yeah. And, you know, so and that's another building point. On and uh, building on that, going back to the whole everything must have a cause or a reason, well, what is the reason for this God and what caused him? Because if you're going to argue oh, yeah. and say the universe is so complex, it requires a creator, well, surely something that can make a universe is going to be very complicated as well. And, and it's like you said earlier, like the universe is already crazy and beautiful enough. Why do we need to complicate it further? with this God idea of which there is no evidence and tying it in to kind of wrap up my point here is that the anthropomorphic, uh, like anthropomorphizing of the universe is so evident in how we've approached almost all the gods that have ever existed. They almost all look like us. And if you notice most people's religion kind of goes with what their culture wants anyway. And depending on where you were at yeah. scientifically, some religions have, a, like, I'm not going to say there's any science in them, but they're a little bit closer to having a shot at being somewhat like what's really going on based on where your culture was at at the time that it came about. Yeah, I think the ancient Greek philosopher Xenophanes pointed out that if triangles had gods, you know, that the gods would have three sides, and if horses had mm -hmm. gods, there would be horses, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. So and he's exactly right. And also the idea uh, kind of reminds me of Star Wars. Um, could God be an unconscious force of some kind? Um, could God be mortal and dead now? Could there be an afterlife and no God or vice versa? And people like, you know, with, for example, Pascal's wager, they make all these assumptions. And there's so many problems with that, that argument. It's not the even an argument, argument for God. Ever. It's an argument for belief in a God or pretending belief mm -hmm. in a God. Um, but you know, lost my train of thought. So, uh, yeah, so they assume that then there's an afterlife and what that specific afterlife scenario would be. It's one of the things that they assume there. Um, <clears throat> so don't omnipotence and omniscience conflict logically if something is all-knowing and all-powerful? You know, can it change what it's going to do? It already knew what it was going to do, you know, you know getting yes. into that. It's a huge trap door you set for yourself there if you believe that. And another thing about how we figure this idea out. Um, Arthur C. Clarke said that if someone from the future came to us with sufficiently good enough technology, 
they would appear as gods to us. So as right. crazy as the guy with the hair and the aliens is, his nonsense has a much higher chance of being real than any of the gods because we know technology exists. If we can make it, and if a being can traverse the universe or at least the galaxy and make it here, they're going to have some things that we are not going to be able to even contemplate in the slightest sense. Yeah. So that could be yet another possible choice that you throw onto this, or you could simply follow the evidence where it is leading, we, you know, which seems like a better way to operate. I would go for following the evidence where it's leading, especially when every piece of evidence we find keeps pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And doesn't God explain complexity with more complexity, a mystery with a bigger mystery? Yeah. Isn't this a non-explanation which merely shifts all the same questions from the universe to God? Like you were mentioning, you know, what's God's purpose? You know, what, what mm -hmm. gives him his morality? You know, his standards? Um, you'll, you'll inevitably hear God always existed. Well, why can't that be the case for the universe? Um, you know, again, it's simpler than a God with much clearer and greater <laughs> evidence for his existence. Um, let's see, we, we've already covered some of this a uh, matter and energy are interchangeable and energy could be eternal as well again could be the quantum foam uh, again we could go through cycles uh it could be a phase transition from a, a multiverse um, and and energy you know has different meanings and different contexts as well like you know there's a bomb blowing up energy there's the energy inside of us we're constantly going through there's you know many different ways of talking about it in physics and and I think like a lot of what we've talked about, if you notice with what like the religious do, especially apologists, is they kind of like <clears throat> overload you with different little small things. They try to kill you with like a thousand stabs. All right. And science just comes in with the big cold blade and just slices God off right at the head. And it's not that science is setting out to do this. I mean, believe me, here in America, like what, 60 something percent of all scientists have a faith. So if they could prove of God... Science. Yeah, I haven't like heard as that. As far as I that's know, that's accurate. I mean, that's all all fields. Everything I know, like ninety five percent so, of the National Academy of Science is basically atheists, mm -hmm. and the same for the Royal Society in Britain and, and all elite scientific organizations. So, so like that's a very good point. So, if that five percent could prove God with a scientific method, wouldn't they be doing that and collecting their Nobel Prize? And, yeah, it's you know, the so people, people always speak for God. All, all we yeah, ever did is people exactly. claiming things about God. You know, His wh human whatever. representative, who is a mammal just like me and you, somehow yeah. wants to boss us around because they can talk to the boss. No, I'm not. Yeah, the going boss to never talks that. to us. I mean, and wouldn't he? I mean, you know, if he's a good boss, wise, would. Yeah. <laughs> he just lets people send conflicting and vague messages, and mm -hmm. you know, not important at all. Just your your salvation, whatever that means, <laughs> uh, depends on it. You know, um, definitely. So one thing that I do find interesting is that. Our most immediate experience of the universe is through our mind or, or through our senses. And, and Immanuel Kant kind of pointed this out. Um, so that's interesting. But I don't really think that really lends any credibility to the idea that a mind could have created the universe. Just because it's our most immediate experience of the universe. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can test things like, you know, we know that our senses and thoughts perceive the universe pretty accurately and we can pretty much agree that there's at least something some kind of universe whatever you want to say beyond that um but it does does appear that we perceive it accurately enough as evidenced by all we've been able to do and build like the civilization right um and also there is an obvious evolutionary survival advantage to accurately diagnosing the world so i've heard the argument that Evolution doesn't favor intelligence. Why, why would it favor intelligence? You know, if there's, it, it hasn't always favored intelligence. You know, you know, we have bacteria that have been around for way longer than us. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's it's obvious that you get a certain type of animal in a certain type of environment, and intelligence is going to be something that is obviously beneficial. You know, if you're stupid and you're not, your thoughts are not matching up to reality, you're going to die, right? Yes. So it's pretty clear that and it is. And if there's going to be billions and billions of you, you need to either be really small or really powerful where nothing can kind of mess with you within your environment, or you need to be really smart. And, you know, 
there's no pattern to that really, except once you get into what can survive the most, what can have the most sex or, you know, replicate itself the most in whatever way you go about doing that. And there is no design to that. And if there yeah. is, I mean, it, it looks just like chaos. <laughs> yeah. Another point is we know of no consciousness without a physical substrate, without a brain. Um, we know that like when you're tired, your consciousness is altered, you know, if you haven't had a cup of coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we've known for hundreds of years uh, back in the Enlightenment, they were they were discussing this, uh, that when a part of your brain corresponding to a certain function is damaged, say memory or facial recognition, then that function is, is altered. And basically, you know, while you're still alive, you can be a completely different person. You know, mm -hmm. they can split the brain. They can see what the different things that the size of the brain does all kinds of things that really diminishes this idea of um, an immaterial soul, basically. And yeah, Steve like, Baker has a quote that, you know, the immaterial soul can be bisected with a knife and altered by chemicals, blows, electricity, or lack of oxygen. And we can also see brain activity lit up in machines and doing certain specific things. Uh, so it really does seem, you know, even we, though we don't understand subjective experience entirely, that it is an emergent property of the material. It's neurons firing, basically. Mm -hmm. It's and, like somebody, and, somebody once said, you know, what it, how was thought material? But it's it, you're describing a process. Like when you say, uh, when you say digestion, you know, that's you're you're describing a process that takes place in your body, mm -hmm. or ball, the ball the ball is rolling down the hill. You're describing something that's going on, an activity of, of a material process. Exactly, and that ball rolling down the hill has no goal or plan. It's simply just physics happening in real time. And what you were talking about with the mind, like think of all the women who got lobotomized just for asking questions or daring to read books or whatever was illegal at the time. Are their souls intact once they die or are they in heaven or hell as the lobotomized version of themselves? You know, how do you answer these questions with no evidence. When you see your parents again, how old is everybody? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are you Yo, your decrepit old self or, or them? Are yeah, you, like Hitchens what? was talking about when he had cancer, uh, you know, <laughs> like, I hope this is not the body I have in heaven if that's where I somehow end up. You know, mm. I mean, nobody would want that body in heaven, you know, for Hitchens, how he died. Scott, are you still seeing my image on the screen kind of in the minimize in the corner? or? Yeah, yeah, I am. All right. Wrapping up on my blog, uh, the last paragraph or section here. Um, so <clears throat> what science does seem to keep telling us is things are bottom up and evolutionary, you know, from life to the mindless formation of stars, solar systems and planets. And, you know, complexity doesn't necessarily mean design and things we think look designs have been shown to be formed by bottom up mindless natural processes. It's also, of course, a fallacy to compare things humans make like watches and paintings with nature. And again, the same with cause. The universe may have a cause or not. We've been over that. Mm -hmm. Um. So, we don't know if time started or or if it's eternal. That's something that you mentioned. Um. Again, in quantum physics, cause seems to play no part. Same for purpose or goals. Um. But, uh, if theists assert a super immaterial being who exists for some unknown reason, who spoke matter into existence, you know, they're the ones who kind of believe in magic. I don't think mm -hmm. magic is how we're going to discover things going forward. This hasn't been how we discovered anything, you know, previously. Uh, they think their purpose is to somehow be in bliss while being on eternal bend and knee to a master who has billions of good people and loved ones held in eternal flames. Um, they think that the supposed creator of parasites, childhood cancer, and hurricanes, a being of also human hatred, vindictiveness, and indifference is loving. And again, this looks like an anthropomorphic projection born of cos cosmically microscopic human fear mm -hmm. and ignorance yes. um so again uh, you know why is there something there may have to be something something may be a more natural state than nothing um empty space is full of potential something and energy and particles and gravity and evolution are natural sculptors even amidst entropy um if i can find the quote uh, carol was talking about entropy you know things wearing down is kind of what lets um complexity arise in certain pockets yes so it's kind mm -hmm. of like if you use the the image of your bedroom right um <clears throat> you can keep things have to keep getting messy but if you keep throwing your stuff outside the window and the, the in the lawn you can kind of keep making your room uh you know 
be neat, basically. <laughs> um, and of course, on the Earth, you know, we talk about the second law of thermodynamics, uh, that things have to keep winding down. How do we have this emerging complexity? Well, the Earth is not a closed system. It's part of the interaction with the sun. Um, and obviously, that's that's a fallacious um, observation there. Um, and again, science, no, no, nothing in science, no theory you're finding includes God. Science needs to know God to explain anything. Uh, faith is an un- unreliable path to truth, leading to multiple contradictory and unresolvable conclusions. Um, again, it's a poison to the enterprise of systematic doubt that is science, that enterprise that, unlike religion, for all its millennia of hegemony, really does improve people's lives with justified hope, health, and opportunity. And it's that enterprise that has actually made progress and has a reliable and verifiable means to keep making it. It's that enterprise that has actually uncovered facts about the world and substantiated its claims. And let's continue in that noble quest. Yes. That's very well said and beautifully written. And to build on that, um, on, on a few points you made that I think are really just devastating to all of the arguments not founded in reason that that we've talked about is entropy why 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 must we break down over time why must we age so horribly why can't you know we live 800 years like you know people used to be able to I'm, i mean if i have to pretend to kill my son to live for 800 years you know i might have a son and do that and according to god that would be moral and right. just you know how do you take a way of thinking that has something that absurd in it and believe that it can answer these beautiful and complex questions that to me that you know give my life any kind of semblance of meaning the not knowing is much more beautiful than pretending that we know everything and faith can make you believe anything I mean, if you can believe that a snake, an animal without vocal cords, can talk in certain circumstances, what else can you be made to believe? I mean, really think about that. It's like Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And that statement is always going to be true. I wanted to read a couple of quotes from Carol's book uh, on complexity and entropy. So he says, in both physics and biology, complexity often emerges in a hierarchical fashion. Small pieces conglomerate into larger units, which then conglomerate into even larger ones and so on. Smaller units maintain their integrity while interacting together with the whole. In this way, networks are built up that exhibit complex overall behavior emerging from simple underlying rules. Um. So yeah, I mean, that complex- makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, just look at gravity. It seems really simple. You throw something up, it goes down, but it's much more complex than that. There's a lot going on. And I no. mean, just, you know, it, it's just simple things like that that are so beautiful to me. Just the fact that we can contemplate what gravity is, the fact that we can know and understand it. What's more inspiring, that or the burning bush? And you look at something like a, a snowflake, you know, that. That's one example of, you know, complexity just kind of spontaneously based on certain patterns, certain laws mm-hmm. uh, emerging. Um, yes. Uh, he says the appearance of complexity isn't just compatible with increasing entropy. It relies on it. The only reason complex structures form at all is because the universe is undergoing a gradual evolution from very low entropy to very high entropy. This order is growing, and that's precisely what permits complexity to appear and endure for a long time. The increase of entropy over time literally brings the universe to life. <clears throat> so um, I also wanted to touch on this idea about uh, science and naturalism and, and the relationship of the two. Because, uh, going back to that uh, interview I had with that theist from the Ask and Wonder uh, podcast. One, another thing, and, and you know, these discussions, you're talking about a secular world, but you end up talking about so many things because the idea of God and religion intersects with so many things. Mm-hmm. Um so we ended up talking about, you know, naturalism and science, and um, he tried to make the case. A science can't say anything about naturalism, and I'm like, what? What? <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what, what rock are you living under? Um, 
so just just reading a quote on this from Carroll's book, uh, he says that there's nothing in the practice of science that excludes the supernatural from the start. Science tries to find the best explanations for what we observe. And if the best explanation is a non-natural one, that's the one science will lead us to. The relationship between science and naturalism is not that science presumes naturalism. It's that science has provisionally concluded that naturalism is the best picture of the world we have available. At the end of the process, we find that naturalism gives the best account of the evidence we have. And by a long shot. So, yes. It's yeah, not even close. You, yeah, if you go back in time, you can find religion and, and science mixed up. But what happened is, you know, people kept finding, they, they kept not matching up, basically. You know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, like the uh, claims of religion have definitely fallen victim to uh, a sort of entropy as well. It just <laughs> yeah. doesn't hold up. You know, it just simply does not hold up. And I mean, if you think about you know, like I keep talking about why and the not knowing. And, and to me, that's beautiful. But I've come to discover over time that to a lot of people, that's terrifying. And, you, you, yeah. you know, when you add that to the fact that religion, I guess, a, like a way to put it is it's sort of bought up all the real estate in these discussions first, either through just being our first and therefore worst attempt at deciding things and figuring it out. And then you add in you know, being backed by the local biggest tribe and then to the local biggest state and government, these ideas are going to be very hard to fight against. And especially when it makes so many appeals to emotion, because most people don't want to think about, well, when I die, I go back to the earth and, you know, I've eaten uh, uh, plants and animals. And now, you know, maybe plants and animals both can feast off of me. You know, they, they want to see grandma again, which mm-hmm. that would be nice, but it simply is just wishful thinking. I mean, it would be nice if it wasn't, but there's just no evidence to support it. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to touch on is mathematics. And, um, you know, there is the debate about is, is mathematics invented or is it something we find in the universe? And I can understand why a theist would maybe think that mathematics, because it's, got, it's an abstract very precise, intricate, uh, complex thing might speak to some kind of mind, ordering mind or whatever. Um, but really, what it is, is it's a language that we invented that corresponds mm-hmm. with the world. It's kind of like English. English works pretty well because it's something we invented that matches up with things that we observe in the universe. You know, And so we can talk about them and we can, we can do things based on them. We can communicate based on, on, on the language, right? Um, yes. <clears throat> there's no doubt that the universe is pretty much consistent in a lot of ways. And that's, that, that's what, why math is useful, you know, why, why it works. So I wanted to play kind of a, <clears throat> a short thing here that, um, rationality rules did kind of an interview briefly with some, uh, some scientists about math and, you know, why, whether mm-hmm. or not math is, is, uh, miraculous. Let me know if you can hear okay. it. All right. All right. I will. No, I, I can't hear it. You can't hear it? Okay. Let me uh, go back and see. All right, I'm going to enable this. So, enable sound. Let me know if you can hear it now. But for now, here are just yes, three I can. accounts from, in this order, theoretical physicist Sabina Hosenfelder, theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg, and then cognitive linguist and philosopher George Lakoff. But maybe you do not agree that the effectiveness of mathematics is all that unreasonable. No, I do not think that it is all that unreasonable that mathematics is effective in the natural sciences. Um, Because what is mathematics about? It is um, a way to describe patterns, to describe regularities. And that's exactly what we do in the natural sciences. First of all, How accurate is mathematics in explaining physics? I don't think mathematics can be ever regarded as uh, an explanation in itself of anything. And this has not always been well understood. Um, Perhaps it's even 
still controversial. Physical theories aren't the way they are because of principles of mathematics. Principles of mathematics are the, they are the language in which we state our physical principles and they are the way the intellectual tools we use for calculating the consequences of those principles. But nothing is the way it is because of some mathematical principle. There is still a, a mathematics in the world, even if human beings never existed or if brains never existed. It's not in the world. The world is as it is. Uh, let's take a very simple case. Uh, take a spiral nebula. The logarithm of the spiral is not in the nebula. It's in your understanding of the nebula. The marvelous thing about mathematics is that we can create mathematics with our brains that fit phenomena in the world remarkably. It is not a miracle that that's the case because we ha are, have the capacity to see and understand the world, to, to categorize it in terms of what our brains do, and then we can create a mathematics out of that in a systematic way using what our brains allow us. In case you want to hear more voices such as those just shown, know that all three of the prior clips, they are not certain. As far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. And second, this to account for our works so well in the physical world because is a non-answer. It's the equivalent of the universe is relatively consistent. It's not strange or mysterious, let alone miraculous. It's expected. By contrast, for theists, mathematics works so well in the physical world because God has chosen to create the world according to the plan he had in mind. Right, so according to Craig, the answer, mathematics is effective because the universe is relatively consistent, is unsatisfactory. But the answer, mathematics is effective because of God, is somehow perfectly satisfactory. God is a non-answer. It's the equivalent of because I said so. It not only doesn't answer the how element intrinsic to the why question, but it actively shuts down investigation. It stalls progress and rots the mind. When Newton's laws did not account for the trajectory of all the celestial bodies in the solar system, he invoked God, and in doing so turned his brilliant mind off. So far as he was concerned, he had answered the question, but he had not. There was a natural explanation that not only answered why, but more crucially answered how. And the answer, funny enough, required us to alter our mathematical axioms. Mathematics and physics work so well together because the same mind that designed the universe on a mathematical model also built the universe on the same mathematical model. All of this adds up to an argument for the existence of God that goes like this. If God does not exist, the applicability of mathematics is just a happy coincidence. If you, like me, are not convinced of the proposition that the effectiveness of mathematics is miraculous in the religious sense, then this premise will strike you, as it does me, as bewildering. Charles Darwin once wrote that a mathematician is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat which isn't there. And I would say that this fairly summarizes the fact that while we have good reason to suspect that the mathematics that applies to our environment also applies to radically different environments, we do not know with certainty that it does. In any case, I, and evidently many mathematicians and physicists, do not consider the effectiveness of mathematics to be unreasonable, let alone miraculous. I would in fact be more shocked and find it more unreasonable if our mathematics did not apply to other macroscopic environments. This is to say that so far as I am concerned, Craig is committing a black and white fallacy, in which black is God and white is coincidence, or chance. He spent a total of 30 seconds attempting to justify why the only other option to God is happy coincidence. But as expressed earlier, naturalists have a plethora of ways to account for the effectiveness of mathematics, including the one I have given throughout. But the applicability of mathematics is not just a happy coincidence. Therefore, Oh, we got an ad. If you manage a team, you have to. <laughs> Money.com is a platform. Just to say it that out. Yeah. yeah this is really good. Exactly. For the horse. His argument is essentially a reskin of presuppositionalism, <clears throat> in which he's replaced the laws of logic with the axioms of mathematics. Now, to ensure that Craig's specific presentation here isn't simply a weak rendition, I've listened to him debating the philosopher Dr. Graham Oppie on this very argument, and I've digested just about every video on YouTube I can find of him discussing the topic. But I found nothing of greater substance than what's found in this short, polished presentation. Take mystery number one, the applicability of mathematics. I think this is 
a huge issue. If I'm honest, this is the kind of argument I'd expect from the likes of Frank Turek, as opposed to Craig. Because of this, I can't help but knock the feeling that I'm missing something. So, if any of you think that I am, then please do let me know and I'll make another video. Anyhow, as always, I'm Stephen Woodford, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported this is too vague. Anyhow, as always, special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. I think it's that you call it a solution. I the trouble is it's it's I think it, my problem is it's too vague. I don't see how you can do much with this particular view. You see, we, we, we when it comes to the explanation of how a physical world operates in terms of mathematics, it's extraordinarily precise. Mm. And and one can say an awful lot about that. But a statement like the one you mm -hmm. make here it worries me because it's you, know, you could call it a solution, but it doesn't tell us very much. Yeah. So. Well, that was really good. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I want to play. And I know we've we both seen this. But just kind of any viewers that watch, you know, my video that haven't seen it, kind of the uh, a brief summary of of, of Sean Carroll on uh, against Craig on his cosmological claims yeah this was one of the most humane murders i've ever seen <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah. carol just choked him out while complimenting him basically yeah john carroll pointed out that the problem with this premise is that it is false there's almost no explanation or justification given for this premise in dr craig's presentation but there's a bigger problem with it which is that it is not even false the real problem is that these are not the right vocabulary words to be using when we discuss fundamental physics and cosmology. This kind of Aristotelian analysis of causation was cutting edge stuff 2,500 years ago. Today, we know better. Our metaphysics must follow our physics. That's what the word metaphysics means. And modern physics, you open a quantum field theory textbook or a general relativity textbook, you will not find the words transcendent cause anywhere. Of course, Craig's response was predictably incredulous. Honestly, I'm, I'm quite astonished that he would think the universe can literally pop into being out of nothing. And Carol responds appropriately. He said he was astonished that I refused to accept the fact that things need causes to happen, to which I can only quote David Lewis, I do not know how to refute an incredulous stare. The second premise of the Kalam argument is that the universe began to exist. And Craig often cites the bordet guth vilenkin theorem as saying that whatever model of the universe you use, they all must have a beginning. I've often said that this is a misinterpretation of that theorem, but finally a physicist sets Craig straight on that issue. So I'd like to talk about the bordet guth vilenkin theorem, since Dr. Craig emphasizes it. And the rough translation is that in some universe, Universes, not all, the space-time description that we have as a classical space-time breaks down at some point in the past. Where Dr. Craig says that the vorte guth vilenkin theorem implies the universe had a beginning, that is false. That is not what it says. What it says is that our ability to describe the universe classically, that is to say not including the effects of quantum mechanics, gives out. Craig, of course, doesn't accept this, but what Carroll does later is fucking priceless. In case you don't trust me, I happen to have Alan Guth right here, one of the authors of the Borde Guth Vilenkin theorem. Alan, what do you say? He says, I don't know whether the universe had a beginning. I suspect the universe didn't have a beginning. It's very likely eternal, but nobody knows. Now, how in the world can the author of the Borde Guth Vilenkin theorem say the universe is probably eternal? for the reasons I've already told you. The theorem is only about classical descriptions of the universe, not about the universe itself. Now this shows what an incredibly nice guy Sean Carroll is, because if I were in his shoes at that moment, I would have been like, tell me how my ass tastes, Craig. And Craig's <laughs> response is equally priceless. That could be his predisposition or his hope or, or hunch or something of that sort. As is Sean Carroll's response to that. Alan Guth does not believe the universe is eternal because it's a hunch or a personal preference. It's because he's a scientist and he's trying to develop models that fit the data. We have puzzles in cosmology. Given his knowledge of the models, he believes the best way forward, the most promising way forward, are the models in which the universe is eternal. 
elbow from the fucking sky. When Craig talks about <laughs> the fine-tuning issue, he says that if you change even the slightest minute details about the constants of the universe, life cannot exist. Therefore, there must have been a designer which fine-tuned the universe for life. Sean Carroll rightly points out that if you change these details, it is true that life as we know it could not exist. But we have absolutely no grounds in which to assert that there couldn't be some variety of life or some kind of intelligent observer that can exist in universes that has properties different from our own. It is certainly true that if you change the parameters of nature, our local conditions that we observe around us would change by a lot. I grant that quickly. I do not grant that therefore life could not exist. I will start granting that once someone tells me the conditions under which life can exist. What is the definition of life, for example? If it's just information processing, thinking, or something like that, there's a huge panoply of possibilities. They sound very science fiction-y, but then again, you're the one who's changing the parameters of the universe. The results are going to sound like they come from a science fiction novel. Sadly, we just don't know whether life could exist if the conditions of our universe were very different because we only see the universe that we see. A common reply to the fine-tuning argument is the multiverse hypothesis. Craig likes to bring up the Boltzmann brain problem with the multiverse hypothesis. This basically is the idea that if there are so many other universes, that there are enough of them to outweigh the rarity of the fine-tuning of this universe, then there would have to be so many universes that the number of universes in which random quantum fluctuations produced whole brains spontaneously would be vastly more common than universes like this one. So it should be vastly more likely that we experience ourselves existing as one of these spontaneously generated brains rather than finding ourselves existing in this universe. Sean Carroll points out that this is not necessarily the case. This is a significant misunderstanding of how the multiverse works. The multiverse doesn't say that everything that can possibly happen happens with equal probability. It says that there is a definite history of the multiverse and you can make predictions. Different multiverse models will have different ratios of ordinary observers to random observers. That's a good thing. That helps us distinguish between viable models of the multiverse and non-viable models. And there are plenty of viable models where the Boltzmann brain or random fluctuations do not dominate. This was probably the biggest ass kicking that I've ever seen William Lane Craig get. So I'll put a link <laughs> to the full debate in the description. Check it out. I think. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and. Stop share. So yeah, man. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is a, a fascinating topic. You know, cosmology. You know, where did the universe come from, and and, and all of that. <clears throat> and it's um, it seems to be in a lot of ways it's kind of the last retreat of, of theist. You know, they they use the argument from design. You know, and that's been pretty much demolished by Darwin. And they still find ways to say, oh, it, it's guided by God. But you know, it, evolution doesn't have any any again this. It's not te teleological. It has no end goal. You know, it, it can't start over. It has to work with what it has. You know, it's mm -hmm. full of problems uh, that it causes. Um, you know, it, it, like Richard Dawkins called it, the blind watchmaker, natural selection. You know, it's completely blind. It's a completely blind process. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so, but but even in this territory where we may not know everything, we don't know everything, the God hypothesis is, a, once again, a very problematic and unsupported hypothesis. And so, it doesn't seem to be helping to find out anything. I mean, we both probably know this beautiful insight from Sam Harris. He said, I think when he was debating uh, the rabbi David Wolf, he said, I would challenge anyone to name anything for which we used to have a scientific claim or a scientific like, explanation, no matter how you know lacking it may be, that we now have a better explanation for using a religion then think of the inverse of that where we used to have a religious reason for something and we now have a scientific reason that explains it much better you know one of these outweighs the other by quite a lot yeah. and that's for a very good reason and you know both of those videos to me kind of kind of poetically show how us being pattern seeking mammals can lead you on two very divergent paths. You can either see the pattern as an intelligence, or you can see the pattern as just what the this state of being we are in is. You know, it's like how people feel special and like God did something for them. Well, have you ever considered how many billions of us there are and how many billions of us there have been? 
you can expect some absolutely crazy shit to happen. But it doesn't yeah. mean that you're the apple of this creative <clears throat> eye. Yeah, I wanted to. Um, this is from my newest blog, Atheist Before Darwin. It's actually a kind of a, an updating of one that I did uh, years ago. Um, I want to quote from Baron Dolbach from The System oh, of Nature. That's our guy uh, right there. I love him. Yeah. Can you see it pretty clearly? Yeah, I can. Okay. So <clears throat> he says the word God, and this is in 1770, the word God ought to be banished from the language of all those who desire to speak to be understood. These are abstract words invented by ignorance. They are only calculated to satisfy men lacking in experience, men too idle or too timid to study nature and its ways. And then he says, uh, men always deceive themselves by abandoning experience to follow imaginary systems. The beings which he pictures to himself as above nature or distinguished from her are always chimeras formed after that which he has already seen. There is not, there can be nothing outside of that nature which includes all beings. And think of um, those two <laughs> quotes you just read and how they just show you that's how people like William Lane Craig operate. That's why they, as you said, are taking refuge in kind of their last little home base of cosmology and trying to, you know, spout woo-woo with a little bit of facts in it. Yeah. Because A, it's really hard to argue <clears throat> against, and B, it's kind of like it reminds me of how when I was 14 and 15, I was a young Earth creationist because I knew – just enough science to get hustled and let's be honest that's kind of where the average american is at most of the time especially where we live in the bible belt no and, and that's why people like him still have such a following and still kind of grab so many people with their uh you know arguments as pitiful as they are yeah and you know quite frankly i don't um i don't say that i know for absolute certainty you know that dolbox statement there there can be nothing outside of that nature that includes all beings and nature is everything but it certainly seems that way i yes. always question and test the things i believe how Same much do other people so mm -hmm. that that is why I, while i can't you know get on board with i know that <clears throat> excuse me for certain i can't say that w exactly what i know <clears throat> for absolute certain you know <laughs> i think all we can do really do is uh, speak in probabilities, but yes, there are things yes. that the evidence is so you know stacked in their favor that, and the evidence for any alternatives are so, it's just an utter paucity of evidence anywhere that mm -hmm. you know this is where I'm led. This is what it really looks like, you know, and for all intents and purposes, this is reality. Um, just one more quote that I added to this: uh, the argument from uh, which Spinoza, Diderot, and Dolbach rest on as triumphant and unanswerable is that in every hypothesis of cosmogony, you must admit an eternal pre-existence pre of something. And according to the rule of sound philosophy, you are never to employ two principles to solve a difficulty when one will suffice. Then they say, <laughs> they, they say then that it is more simple to believe at once in the eternal pre-existence of the world as it is now going on and may forever go on by the principle of reproduction which we see and witness than to believe in the eternal pre-existence of an ulterior cause or creator of the world, a being whom we see not and know not, of whose form, substance, and mode, or place of existence, or of action, no sense informs us, no power of the mind enables us to delineate or comprehend. And this is from uh, a letter of Thomas Jefferson to John Adams, April 11th, 1823. Uh, 1823. Jefferson, Jefferson, despite all of his um, irreligion, uh, he did go on to say I, that I believe in there's some kind of creator in that letter, but I just included this because I thought I thought it kind of articulated pretty well the kind of basic, oh, yeah. for us, you know, of, of what what we're saying and what science is saying. And I'm I'm pretty sure that Jefferson would not be a, a deist or, or whatever he, oh, uh, yeah. he calls himself nowadays. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, just like with Newton, like there's no way Newton would have still believed in alchemy if he were around today you know i mean it's just that is um like it's it's funny you brought that up because i i watched recently uh neil degrasse tyson did a presentation on intelligent design and i think he did it in the early 2000s and uh, he talked about how you know many religious people will take refuge in their arguments of trying to advocate for their side by saying 
Well, look at how many of the most intelligent people that ever lived believed in a God. And, and the thing about that is, is that as the religion are always, uh, as the religious are always saying, we have to look at it in context. Look at the information they had available in, you know, 1500, 1600, 1700, even 1800s. Deism was as far as you could take the argument because we just not, simply not for did not know. I mean, as we, I, I mean not for everybody, but. But yeah. in general, and yeah. especially in general among the educated, and just, you know, that is a really good way of looking at it to think of, you know, where would these people be at today with the information we have? And this is a good way to to kind of argue with people and their heroes. Like if someone loves a, a Jefferson or any other, you know, deist throughout history, you can say if they were here today and operating in the same way of following the evidence wherever it leads – Mm -hmm. Do you honestly think they would still believe in a God? Well, even even we can... even then, when Jefferson was living in France as the ambassador to uh, for America to France, um, he and he knew basically he, he knew Condorcet, who was an atheist, uh, who was a follower of Diderot and Dolbach, and he knew Graham, who was Diderot's best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a letter to his nephew Peter Carr, I believe it was 1787, um, saying, you know, uh, question with boldness the existence of a God. Because if there be one, he, he must favor the, you know, using reason than blindfolded fear. And mm -hmm. he said, don't be frightened by any any um, possibility or any any consequences this might lead to. You know, the, that your reason is the only oracle given you by heaven. And, uh, you know, fix reason firmly in her seat. Call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. And don't believe mm -hmm. anything just because any persons or descriptions of persons believe something. Uh, so even back then, you know. But again, I, I do want to reemphasize that this is not as well known. You know, there were a lot of atheists. Yeah, this is something studying the Enlightenment that I didn't quite know. But books you got uh, somewhere back there, and I'm loving the bookshelf background and everything. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Looking at your books, <laughs> um, you got Jonathan Israel's Enlightenment series somewhere. Yes, yeah, you just started that way. Yeah. Okay. If you if you start in the, in the very first one, Radical Enlightenment, uh, back, published 2001, I think. He's talking about in the 1600s, they were talking about atheists all the time. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, and Spinoza was kind of basically an atheist. And he was a huge iconic figure that, um, as Jefferson, just, you know, that letter of Jefferson, he kind of connects that, you know, him to Diderot mm -hmm. and Dolbach. And, um, there was a whole school of people, you know, um, Dolbach Salon in France was the intellectual center of the, of the intellectual world for decades. And they were straight up atheists. The vast mm -hmm. majority of them. just like back <laughs> so, in uh, from I think it was like about the late <clears throat> seven hundreds to the early eleven hundreds, Baghdad was the cultural center of the world, and they didn't have the term atheist then. I believe they called them doubters. I'm pretty sure that that's what they called them. And just think of of, of just how powerful it is to know that you're not alone in your thoughts of doubting God, yeah. and that's why reading is so powerful because you know you may think this is an idea I only have. And then bam, you see that, you know, uh, Diderot in the 1700s talked about, you know, evolution uh, as a possibility, things uh, changing over time. He talked about, you know, living without a God and living well, like in his, uh, uh, his work where he's uh, kind of, I don't know, charming the, the Christian lady, you know? Yeah. 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 It, it shows that, that all of this is possible. And the thing about Israel and, and his works, uh, I, I've just started them. But uh, what you said about atheism is so true, and I think we know why so many people aren't aware of this, because the people recording history at that time were not atheists. And, you know, think of when an atheist published their work, it had to be under another name. And Even the atheistic writers pushback. from antiquity, they were constantly maligned. And just like you couldn't say Spinoza's or name cute. out loud <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't say Spinoza's name out loud, louder in writing, pretty much. You know, you couldn't say mm -hmm. Epicurus or... Um, Socrates Eric. was killed just for asking questions. Yeah. Well, Socrates thought he had a demon, and that was kind of <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Definitely, the further you go back, I find you really have to compartmentalize and take the best out of the figures that you want to that you yes. have a, see in an overall positive light. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the doubting the Socratic method—that's definitely a great legacy. And as I was saying in my uh, previous podcast with some Enlightenment scholars like uh, Philip Blome and um, Andrew S. Coran, uh, 
you know, we, we do have a tradition, you know, secular, sec, secular atheist people are going back very some intellectual giants, you know, um, not, not as well known for obvious reasons as, you know, some of the people that I find completely unappealing and unconvincing, like an, an Aquinas or a, um, St. Augustine, um, who was awful in so many yes. ways. Um, but yeah, we, there, there is that. Um, and, uh, I recommend the book, um, Atheism in the Classical World, um, Battling the Gods by Tim Whitmarsh. So, okay. you know, the word atheist comes from, uh, atheo, so, you know, without deity, uh, from ancient Greece. So mm-hmm. ancient Greece, man, it gave us so much <laughs> democracy. Yeah, can you imagine if they would have just, you know, been a little better about, you know, not killing each other all the time. This, this, you know, oh, how much oh, further along could we be? Problems. They had a lot of limitations yeah. to the, to the <laughs> internet, but yeah, but you know, the, the Ionians, they were the first basically naturalist scientists that tried to explain things without recourse to, to God, to the supernatural. Um, and there are several of those you could kind of call atheists or pretty close to it. So yeah. And my blog here, Atheist Before Darwin, I mentioned a few of them. So yeah. But yeah, man, uh, this was fun. I guess we'll wrap up. Um, okay. You're going to be, again, you're going to be, uh, I believe, kind of a, at least part-time co-host. So Yeah, yeah, definitely so, looking forward to that, man. Like we always yeah. have great talks. I'm going to try to start something of my own eventually. Awesome. And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely looking forward to more of these. So, and just Yeah, some upcoming ones that I have in, in the near future are uh, Richard Carrier is supposed to come on September awesome. 6th, which I think is a week from Sunday. From this Sunday, I think so. I believe it's about noontime Central U.S. Okay. So if you're available for that, you know, uh, John Loftus is going to be on at some point. Oh, okay. Uh, and some others lined up. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yep. you're doing great with this, man. I'm I'm really proud of you, man. It's been I'm trying to keep going, man. It's super a, it's a, fun to watch. It can be a tough process, though. I mean, as I'm sure any any YouTuber, especially talking about the things I talk about. <laughs> You know, I'm not like, yeah. I don't have videos of food or, you know, my daughter <laughs> or, uh, stuff like that, that really, you know, but yeah. Maybe we should start a skeptical TikTok. I mean, uh, <laughs> so many people are on that, just like, you know, like, like minute long clips with a link to something, yeah. you know, longer might be a good idea. I don't know. Yep. Well, anyway, man, it's been fun. Uh, so take care. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely.